Hello and welcome to this Martin Audio webinar on the WPL loudspeakers, part of our Wavefront Precision series of Array loudspeakers. My name is Robin Dibble. I am one of a team of product support engineers here at Martin Audio. Uh, we look after all of our customers and distributors' needs in terms of uh, system design where requested. We look after product training, uh, applications, and uh, manuals, user guides, all that kind of thing, as well as looking after the webinars like the one we're doing here today on our optimized line sources. So WPL is part of a series of loudspeaker arrays. There are four in the range now, all of which use uh, a concept we call scalable resolution to electronically optimize the performance of line arrays. So to achieve even frequency response, controllable SPL across our audience space, and to reduce level in the areas where we have no audience are the goals of our optimized line source systems. So we're going to start today by having a look at the WPL loudspeakers themselves. The cabinet itself is very compact when you consider what's inside it and also its output capability. We use the scalable resolution, which is configured through our Display 2.3 software, to optimize the array to make sure that whatever venue you deploy the system in, you will get optimum coverage and sound quality for every member of your audience. It's very quick and easy to deploy through a fast three-point rigging system and has excellent horizontal pattern control at 90 degrees due to the fact that it is all fully horn loaded. It's partnered up with dedicated multi-channel high quality class D amplification and this is what gives the DSP magic that enables us to do the electronic optimization of these arrays. It's a three-way bi-amplified enclosure. So there's an active crossover between the lows and the mids and a passive crossover between the mids and highs. So the box itself has a basic frequency response of 52 Hertz through to 18K, pretty much a full range device on its own with a maximum peak SPL of 145 dB. Now it's worth noting that here at Martin Audio, we still specify our peak levels at being a realistic 6 dB above average. A lot of other manufacturers these days have doubled that and go for 12 dB or in some cases more as a peak figure. We prefer to stay with something that's realistic and achievable, in this case with WPL at 145 dB. As I said, the horizontal coverage is at 90 degrees, Vertical coverage, 7.5 degrees per box, and a very respectable weight of 64 kilos for a box with that kind of output capability. So, what's inside? Well, to start with, we have three 1-inch exit compression drivers mounted on a waveguide for the high frequency. Now, we like to use multiple small high frequency drivers because compared to a single large diaphragm device, we get far better low frequency extension and far lower distortion at the top end of the frequency range. Added to which, we have no need to use large diaphragm compression drivers and the lower frequency extension that they provide because at 3.5 kilohertz, we cross over into our two six and a half inch horn loaded mid-range devices. So the mid-range drivers cover the whole range from 350 hertz up to three and a half K. So that's the entire vocal range covered in these two drive units. So there are no crossover points in that critical intelligibility and quality band. Having them horn loaded and compression loaded as well behind that horn means they're much more efficient than a traditional direct radiating mid-range driver and also gives us far improved horizontal pattern control. The low frequency section you can see there, two 12 inch low frequency drivers facing backwards into the cabinet, venting out to the real world in front of the uh, cones with a short horn. This means we can get increased efficiency from our 12 inch drivers. You can also see that behind the drivers we have a slot loaded reflex chamber that extends our low frequency extension, gives us more extension down to the 54 hertz we've already mentioned. And the design of that slot means we have reduced power compression, we have reduced port turbulence, and therefore less low frequency noise coming from the enclosure. WPL is partnered with the SXH218 subwoofer. This is a dual 18 inch hybrid device, so horn loaded in front, reflex loaded behind the drivers again, 
with a massive maximum SPL capability of 148 dB peak when it's driven from a bridged pair of IK42 amplifier channels. It can be built in omnidirectional or cardioid arrays. Each box has a nominal impedance of 4 ohms. So that's both drivers connected in parallel across the amplifier output terminals. Weight is 120 kilos. There is also a flown version of the 218, exactly the same technical specification, but as you can see from the picture here, we have full rigging hardware on the front and rear of the sub so it can be flown in front of, alongside, well, probably not in front of, but alongside, behind or above your WPL array. Inside the sub, there are two 1700 watts AES rated 18 inch drivers. They have a short horn in front of them and slot loaded reflex behind. Again, maximizing efficiency due to the short horn and extension due to the slot loading reflex behind. Again, this slot loading giving us all the output benefits, but without having port turbulence and low frequency noise from the enclosure. So the benefits of a WPL, in fact, of all our Wave and Precision series, is that you get consistent coverage straight out of the box without any trial and error through using our display software to optimize the array. This gives you all the settings that you need, both physical and electronic, to match your array to the venue in which the performance is taking place. So you have smoother, improved audience coverage and reduced energy levels in all the areas where you don't want it. So up in the roof space or on back walls or behind the arrays on the stage itself, meaning you get a cleaner overall sound throughout the venue. So let's look at how we get the system uh, deployed and look firstly at the rigging. So here we have the suite of WPL rigging tools. The box itself has three point captive rigging with preset uh, rigging angle capability. There is the touring flybar. We also now have an installation flybar. There's the WPL outriggers, which are used for ground stacking to give increased stability. The touring flybar doubles as the ground stack bar and also the transition bar between the subs and the array itself when flown in that fashion. The sub has four point captive rigging. And we also have the WPL cart. This allows the stacking and flying of four WPA cabinets, WPL cabinets directly in and out of that frame, making it very easy to deploy. Wheel the array elements in underneath your winch point, connect it to the array, put your preset angles into the back of the boxes, fly it out, and away you go. So the WPL enclosure itself, three point rigging system. We have pocket handles on the sides to help you deploying it and pull the array up from the back as you fly. Floating front links. This is quite an important feature because it means that the system can be flown easily even on uneven surfaces. So you pull the side pins out and it enables those front points to move. Moving those front points means that uh, you can independently change the height of the uh, cabinets on the ground compared to those on the array. So it makes it easier and safer to fly the entire setup. On the back, we have a rear link arm that connects the two cabinets together at the back. And we have the captive lock pin and link pins fixed to the rear of the box. Display angles adjustable between 0 and 7.5 degrees for every box and the degree required is given to you by the display software during the setup process. On the 218 subwoofer, we have a four point rigging system and we have integrated handles on the sides. You can also see there uh, access to the driver chambers should you need to get at the driver at any point in time. There are our four rigging links on the top of the cabinet to connect either to the fly bar or to the cabinet above. And on the bottom, we have the link pins for that connection to whatever happens to be below.
The grid itself, this is the full touring grid we can see here. On the top we have two shackles to fly the array. There are our ground stack links to connect to the WPL cabinets themselves when you're ground stacking. Now you can ground stack up to six WPL. Uh, flying limit is 24 WPL or 16 when you need BGVC1 safety status. Lock pin on the front to hold the uh, support tags in place. And you can see on the bottom we have there our front rigging point when you are forward hanging the array on the array we'll ex on the frame. We'll explain that a little more in a moment. And at the rear you can see the rear rigging point there for the sub. Secondary front rigging point, that point is used when you are flying the array to the rear of the frame. And there's the link pin you can see in the center for connecting the array to the rear of the array. 20 single point pickup positions across the top so you can single point hang this array though we would strongly recommend certainly with larger arrays that two points are a better way to go purely sim and simply for uh, ease of maneuverability man and handling and also safety you can also see on that section there there are the ground stack tilt angle holes you can ground stack it with down tilt of up to minus 10 degrees and an up tilt of plus four degrees on the frame The installation grid, as you can see, this is a far simpler grid. It's lower cost and it's simpler for those applications where WPL is going to be permanently installed. Again, we have our two shackles on the top for dual point mounting. As we say, it can also be single point mounted when required. You can see it's much lower profile, so more attractive from an installation point of view. And here are the front link pins that connect to the cabinet below the frame. There's the rear link pin, so that's the rear mount point connected to the back of the WPL cabinets. Again, 20 single pickup points for those occasions when you need to fly the array from a single mounting point. So bear in mind with the installation grid, it's simpler. It doesn't have the facility to ground stack the array, obviously. It's a, a simpler three point pickup and the limit here is for 16 WPL cabinets. So looking now at uh, this option I was explaining earlier about uh, hanging the array to the front or rear of the touring frame. With the array mounted at the front of the frame, as you can see to the left, allows the maximum down tilt angle. However, on the right hand side, you can see it with the array towards the rear of the flying frame. This allows for greater up tilt angles. As we said, one or two motors can be used. In uh, either case, it will allow positive and negative tilt angles. And just to reiterate again, that maximum of 24 WPL is allowable on this frame, or 16 if you need to have BGVC1 safety status. Worth pointing out that uh, when you come to the display software, its fly points uh, or height thereof that it takes into account are the connection point between the top of the array and its fly frame that's this highest trim point and the lowest point is at the bottom front corner of the lowest cabinet so the installation grid much the same but you only can hang from the front of this frame rather than front or rear simpler easier to deploy lower cost but reduces the functionality of the array but perfect for those installation applications The WPL cart carries four WPL cabinets. It's 610 mil wide, which means you can put four across the back of a truck. It has guided pre-angle cabinets straight into the position. So you drop it straight down into the base unit of the cart. So the top lifts off, the four poles in each corner come off. You drop the array straight onto the bottom. And as you can see, you pin the array then into the bottom both at the front and the rear of the cabinet for maximum stability and safety when transporting the system. You then reinsert the four poles, which is clip into place with those simple um, clips you can see on the right hand side, put the top back on and away you go. So how does the system go together? Well, with the flying grid, as I said earlier, it doubles not only as a flying grid, uh, but is also a transition frame 
and a ground stack bar. So you can see here we have one grid T on top of the array connected to the subs. We're using another one as a transition point between the subs and the WPL array itself. The software still uses the top of the WPL array as its calculating height. So when you're putting your array height into the software, you need to take that into account. SXHF flown on their own gives you a maximum of 16 cabinets to meet the BGVC1 standard. All the flying hardware is integrated within the cabinets. And of course, you can fly this behind or to the side of your double PL arrays. The ground stack bar accommodates both the um, up tilt array angles of zero to four degrees and down tilt angles from minus one to minus 10. When used as a ground stack, it forms the connection between the touring fly bar and the base of the bottom WPL cabinet. And you can also see there at the front of the frame, the uh, extenders are in use to give increased stability to the front of the cabinets to make sure that it doesn't topple over to the front of the frame. When ground stacking on top of the subs, the touring bar becomes the transition between the subs and the array itself. And you can see that you can then move your stability uh, outriggers to the bottom of the subs again to improve stability to make sure that nothing topples over forward in front of the arrays. OK, so we move on now from rigging and have a look at the amplification and DSP that drives this system. So the WPL systems and the SXH subwoofers are all powered from our Icon IK42 power amplifiers. These are available as standalone units or as a complete racked and ready to go touring solution. These combined with the display software and the ViewNet control software comprise the heart and soul of the WPL system. The IK42 itself has four channels of high quality class D amplification of exceptional sonic quality. 20,000 watts of total output power when you have two ohms per channel and the power supplies in these amplifiers are more than happy with being loaded up with two ohms on every channel and still delivering their maximum capable power. The onboard DSP is capable running at 96 kilohertz but runs at 48k in optimization mode as we do with the WP systems. 85 volts to 240 volts auto sensing main so it will set itself up dependent on its incoming power supply. Audio input analog AES or Dante and it's controlled via Ethernet network for the ViewNet control system to get uh, the best from these amplifiers so you can see what the amplifiers are doing, what's happening to your loads and also upload your settings and control the PA. On the front panel, uh, firstly, we have a, a bunch of LEDs, uh, four together in the center there, you can see. The online one, when it's off, it means it has no uh, Ethernet network connection. When it's flashing, it means the device is searching for an IP address. And when it's permanently lit, it means it's connected to a network and talking to the ViewNet system. The AES3 lights are fairly self-explanatory, really. That lights up when uh, one or more inputs are connected to an AES input source. The overlay LED illuminates when you have active parameters in a group which are not accessible from the front panel. So a classic example of that would be when an optimization file is loaded because you don't have access to any of the parameters within that optimization from the front panel of the amplifier. Finally, the Dante light fairly obviously lights up when any of the Dante network feeds are routed to any outputs of the amplifier. Controls on the front panel, the input, utility and output buttons select the different menus. So input menu fairly obviously gives you access to all the input controls. Utility is all your housekeeping stuff and output all your output controls. The up and down buttons will scroll through each page of menus to get to the individual settings and enter, of course, is used to confirm any adjustments that you make. 
you make the adjustments using either the, using the select and adjust rotary controls on the front panel. Select uh, takes you to whichever parameter is on the screen you want to access. In this case, you can see in the example frequency width or gain. You can see their width is in heavy type. That's what's currently selected. Rotating to the left would take you to frequency, right to gain. Once you've selected your relevant parameter, then the adjust wheel is used to change the level setting of that parameter, be that uh, gain, filter width or frequency. Input level display, fairly self-explanatory. Uh, at the top, we have an input or clip LED, which lights up uh, if the input signal is 1 dB below the input clip level. It also shows if that input is muted. We then have signal level LEDs, the bottom one, the signal light, will activate at approximately minus 40 dBU input level. Our output LEDs show us multiple things. Firstly, the amp over will indicate when there are protection systems running in the amplifier. If none of those have been set, it will show you when the amplifier is clipping. You have output level condition display and an output mute, so a front panel button to mute the channel which will go red when the channel is muted. That will also flash if the output of the amplifier is in a fault condition. The limit LED indicates that the threshold of a limiter setting within the amplifier has been reached. So for example, uh, when you upload an optimization for a WPL system, it will set the limiters appropriately within the amplifier to protect that array. When you reach those limits, that LED indicator will show. The speaker over LED indicates a, limit, a level that's 6 dB over the limiter threshold. It will also light if there's uh, an excursion limiter or thermal limiter being exceeded within the amplifier. Basically, if that light is on, you probably need to turn the system down. Finally, there is a bridge indicator on the front panel to show you when any of the output channels are operating in bridge mode. On the rear panel, we have four analog inputs with link outputs, very convenient for daisy chaining input sources down through a rack. One AES input, which gives you two AES digital channels into the amplifier. In network terms, we have an Ethernet port for your control and Dante primary and secondary network connections. There is a general purpose connection on the back, an auxiliary port, which allows things, for example, like recalling built-in presets via relay contact closures and also external monitoring of the system. Mains connection is via a Nitric PowerCon HC. Connections to our loads to our loudspeaker systems are via the four speakons at the back on the rear left hand side of the panel. So each one of those is connected to one output. So you have individual access to every amplifier channel on those connections. Also, speakon one has uh, channel one on pin pair one and channel two available on pin pair two. Likewise, three gives you access to outputs three and four. Very convenient when you have a bi-amplified cabinet like WPL, you can run a four core cable directly from that output into the array speaker cabinets. Now the IK42s are available as a complete rack and ready touring solution. Uh, in the rack are three IK42s giving you 12 channels of amplification and a total output of 60,000 watts. Also in the rack are two eight port switches which carry the Dante and control data into the amplifiers. The input distribution panel on the complete rack solution looks like this. You have two PACON multi-pin connectors, which gives you six analog inputs to the amplifier rack, generally connected with two connections to each power amplifier. Inputs one and two are also duplicated there, as you can see on the two XLRs with link outs. Next, we have our network connections. First one is uh, for Dante primary combined with ViewNet and Dante secondary networks. Finally, our AES in and link out configuration. So the output distribution panel, there are two versions. This is the IK42 UK and Europe version. Three phase C-form mains connector on the right hand side, as you can see. 
there is a 25 pin link multi-core connector for getting all the amplifier channels straight up to the array in the most convenient form but you also have individual access via nl4s or nl8 connections that's the us version which has the hubble um, three-phase connector 32 amp in place of the european c form Front panel wiring, so the NL8s and NL4s are paralleled with the link connections, so giving you that benefit of being able to individually access outputs rather than having to use a multi-way every time, particularly convenient, for example, when deploying uh, from fill loudspeakers or subwoofers. Okay, let's have a look at how the system goes together and the configurations. So the main components of the WPL cabinet itself, the two variations of the hybrid SXH subwoofer, the amplification racks, and of course the software. Wiring WPL is very simple. It's a four pole speak on NL4. Pin pair one has the connection to the low, two low frequency drivers and pin pair two is connected to the crossover, which splits the mid and high frequencies to the relevant drivers within the box. The SXH subwoofers, the two loudspeakers are connected to pin pair one and two gives a cross over link through, which we'll see in more detail in a moment. So you can connect up to four WPL cabinets to a single IK42 power amplifier when you're using two box resolution. We'll explain this in a little more detail in a moment, but if you're using one box resolution, then you will be connecting just two WPL cabinets to each amplifier. So connecting the four subwoofers to uh, the IK42, again, very simple and straightforward, single four core cable from the amplifier into the first box, links across to the second. That automatically puts the first box on pin pair one and the second box onto pin pair two via a crossover wiring within the first box. So as you can see from the diagram, we take amp channels one and two out through a four core speaker, speaker cable. The two 18 inch drivers in the first cabinet connect to pin pair one. Pin pair two is then crossed within that cabinet over to output on pin pair one so that when you link a four core cable to your second subwoofer it automatically connects those two drive units to output two of the power amplifier very quick very simple and easy to deploy so with a standard WPL array you have a bandwidth from 52 Hertz up to 18 K all your array optimizations your settings as we've mentioned are defined by the display 2.3 software So when we're using scram stack subwoofers with a WPL flown array, we recommend a minimum ratio of two WPL cabinets to one SXH subwoofer. Obviously, that can change depending on the low frequency content uh, and your arrangement of subwoofers in your system. But that is our starting point minimum recommendation for the system. Flown above the WPL, now we have the SXH, and you can see there the two fly bars. Bandwidth of that complete array is 27 Hz to 18K. Now, the ratio here of WPL to subs is very application dependent because uh, different people configure their systems in different ways. So it may be that your entire um, sub deployment is flown above your array. It may be that you have some ground stacked to accompany it. So very much dependent on your application, uh, the ratio between uh, WPL cabinets and subs in this instance. Flown alongside, obviously the same bandwidth, we have the same cabinet, so frequency range is the same. And again, uh, your uh, quantity of subs to array cabinets is entirely dependent on your application. So let's talk a little about this business of scalable resolution, what exactly it means. So we are electronically optimizing these arrays once the physical optimization has been achieved. 
And that's done by changing DSP settings um, within the power amplifiers to get the right relationships between the cabinets to give the coverage pattern that you've asked of it. This can be done in two resolutions. So at its basic level with WPL, that's two box resolution. So two WPL cabinets driven by one set of channels. This gives you a vastly improved smoothness of coverage and SPL control than a conventional array would, but not the ultimate control that going to one box resolution would give you. Quite logical really when you think about it, if you have one cabinet driven by one channel set, we've got a DSP dedicated to every single box in the array, so we can get a far greater degree of control. In terms of hooking that up, that means that with a 12 box array for two box resolution, you're going to need three IK42 power amplifiers, and at one box resolution, you would need to use six. So an increase in cost, but likewise, but also with that goes an increase in smoothness of response and control of SPL throughout the region, including uh, improving the rejection outside of the audience area. So how does that work? So what we're looking at here in the frequency response plots at the top of the screen is the level variance uh, from an eight box array of WPL with uniform drive. So the same signal delivered to every single loudspeaker in that array. And you can see there's quite a lot of difference between the front and the back of the room and the mix position, changing the frequency response, therefore the tonality and even the subjective mix balance due to the different accentuation of different frequency bands in different regions of the room. The upshot of that is depending on where uh, the audience member is sitting, you're going to get an entirely different presentation of the event that's happening. So if we split that down into two box resolution, so each pair of boxes driven by one pair of amplifier channels, that's the graph you can see on the bottom left, immediately you see a huge improvement in uniformity of response and a massive improvement in uh, maintaining SPL levels across the audience space. Improve that to one box resolution and you can see really tight control, SPL levels controlled beautifully throughout the venue and a very, very uniform range of frequency responses. So what are the advantages of this? Well, firstly, it means you can design systems to better suit your project's budgets. Now, from an installation point of view, that means that, for example, uh, you can specify the right number of cabinets to cover the room and go with the lower two box resolution to get a nice far improved coverage than you would with a conventional line array. However, over time and as more money becomes available, it may mean that your customer can invest in more amplification then you simply add the extra amplifiers to the existing PA and improve the coverage throughout the venue, also reducing the reverberant energy in the space, thereby improving the overall sonic quality. From a touring point of view, it means that the same loudspeaker systems can be used at either resolution setting. So for example, your main PA could go out as a one box resolution and your delays may need less resolution. It means you can better fit the budget uh, that your customer has for the tour to your inventory and to the amount of equipment that can go out on that particular tour. So putting the system together, some examples with two hangs of uh, 12 WPL. This is the most basic system at a two box resolution. Three amplifiers, three amplifier racks will give you all the amplifier drive you need for the recommended minimum number of subwoofers and two box resolution cover for the two arrays. Adding another amplifier rack means that you can then deploy your racks more flexibly with two racks either side of the stage, one for the array, one for the subs, and gives you some spare channels for maybe front fills or for additional subwoofers where required. Going to one box resolution, that means we have two racks driving each array of 12. So that's then two multi-cores being flown up to the arrays. Nice, simple and easy to deploy. And again, we have here our two amplifier racks driving subs and any front fill that's required. Quick look at the software. In particular, we're going to talk about Display 2.3 as this is very much the heart of what we can achieve with this system. It's the proprietary software, not only for our WP range of products, but also for MLA and O-Line. It uses an exclusive numerical optimization system to give the best possible coverage throughout the audience space. It's simple to use and was designed from the get-go 
to deploy arrays as quickly and as simply as possible. It gives you the cabinet angles to get the best from the array straight out of the box and the DSP coefficients that you load into your amplifiers to give that unique smoothness that only a Martin Audio optimized system can give you. Workflow is very straightforward. You tell the software the venue data, how big it is, where the venue, uh, where your audience is, where the arrays are, etc. What your objectives are for the system in terms of SPL control and which products you're using. In this case, it would be WPL. So you choose the array type and size, draw a venue slice. We're only looking at uh, vertical coverage control, so we only need an on-axis slice vertically through the venue. Define our audience criteria where the audience is. The software then gives us the mechanical array optimization and the data that we need for that. Gives the electronic optimization and exports the file which we give to our amplifiers to make the system perfectly matched to the venue that we're in. You can also get Ease data as an output from the display software to export into Ease uh, to give you true three-dimensional coverage plots of the sound coverage through a venue, ideal for consultants or for pre-venue system specification. You can also get a 3D wireframe drawing of the array that you created, ideal for giving to architects when they want to uh, show a drawing of a room with the loudspeakers in place. So here we go, very simply, the first step is our vertical slice through the room. You can see here we have a deployment of WPL into a large theater. We tell the software our, where our audience is, that's the green dotted area, where our audience is not, that's the red dotted area, and where we want to place our hard avoid. Hard avoid is a unique feature to Martin Audio. It's an area where the goal of the sound system is to achieve if possible, 30 dBs of level attenuation as against what's happening within the main audience area. So this means, for example, we can get a very quiet stage behind the arrays, which means we don't have all the backwash of the PA going back into the microphones, causing problems with feedback or muddying the sound for the whole venue. All that can be moved and, for example, put on the back wall or a balcony front to stop any intrusive reflections that are happening within the venue further improving the quality for everybody listening within the space. Next, the software calculates the angles that we need to put the array uh, elements at, and also the overall tilt of required for the array. So a key point here is we are telling the system where our array is in terms of where we want to deploy it, height-wise and its um, physical location within the room, and it then optimizes the array to whatever our on-site conditions are. Finally, last set is we optimize the array. We tell uh, the software how many boxes we have, uh, resolution, one or two box. Hit optimize and it goes through, calculates the necessary um, parameters and generates a file which is uploaded to the amplifiers via the ViewNet software. So the advantage of this process is that every time the system is deployed, it's optimized to suit that venue and that audience. It gives you the best possible array shape and performance from your loudspeakers to meet your customers' requirements and needs. Principally, that means you end up with a very even frequency response, which is not achievable with any other system um, due to the resolution and control that display gives the system. We're able to control the SPL profile from the front to the back, so tell it how much level attenuation we want uh, between those at the front and rear of our venue. Crucially, you can also create multiple optimizations for each array. So, for example, in our theater, you could have a second optimization loaded into the amplifiers where the balcony has no coverage. If, for example, um, a gig is taking place where the balcony seats haven't been sold. Switching over to that optimization means you're not putting excessive energy up into a space where there are no customers, therefore reducing the reverberant level within the room and improving sound quality for everybody else. Finally, there's no need for second guessing. You know that when that array goes up into the air and your files are loaded into your amplifiers, you're going to get the performance you need from that system within the space. There's no trial and error. There's no having to try and do it again. And you don't have to spend hours and hours trying to EQ the system to get the results that you want. So the ViewNet control software talks to the power amplifiers. It uploads the files that are generated within Display 2.3, but it also allows you to control all the EQ, 
relative levels, delays of any connected Martin Audio devices on that network from a single laptop. It manages the presets we've been talking about and allows you to store all of those presets, including your EQ curves and general system setups onto your computer for use again and again. You can carry out individual or global ganging across an entire system. So, for example, you can gang your main left and right arrays together for EQ setting. So you know that whatever EQ you set in your left array is what you're going to get in the right. It allows you to monitor system performance, look at the load connected to the amplifiers, also the current state of the amplifiers thermally and in power terms. Crucially, it is also the software which allows you to update the firmware in all of our electronic products. This is something we recommend that you keep a, a good eye out for. We email all our customers regularly whenever there's a firmware update. Keeping your system firmware updated means that it will always be cross-compatible with everybody else's systems and that you will also always have the latest features in your system.